Welcome to Mistar for another frostbitten episode set in the hidden valleys and dense forests of the northern reaches. We're talking about runic magic this time. It's not quite divine magic. It follows none of the formulas and roads of arcane magic. It's both incredibly dangerous and powerful. But what are they? And why are they tied to the immortal patrons of the northern lands? Why keep them a secret? Why does Dana Andrews think you can get them from eating the prunes? I'm Mr. Welch and it's time to pick a tree to hang out on. Runic magic only appeared in the Northern Reaches Gazetteer, and like much of that book, was never mentioned again. Despite the fractured state of those nations, the runes are known throughout all three of them, and those that possess a rune are respected even by their enemies. They aren't a hidden magic, but more like a private achievement. You will be held in high esteem if you have a rune branded on your skin, but no one's going to ask you how you got it. It automatically marks you as a survivor, as a good number of people who undergo the ritual don't come out alive. Strangers will nod at you in respect, but they don't want to know the gory details on how you earned it. What the runes are isn't exactly well defined, and that's on purpose. Physically, they are 24 magically imbued symbols, each with a defined power. The Burkana or Birch Rune can heal its owner, cast bark skin on him, or provide resistance to damage. These abilities are available to anyone who earns the rune, but there are no variants. I'm not going to go through all 24 runes as that would just be padding the runtime. But each rune has two to four powers that typically must be activated by someone familiar with them. Runes can be inscribed onto items, but have to be activated like magic items by someone, again, familiar with the rune. Runes that are branded onto someone can only be activated by the owner, and first they have to survive the branding process. The immortal Odin is the patron of the runes, and he taught their use and meaning to his clerics, the Godi, and to a secretive cabal of followers called the Volva, or Wise Woman. These keeper of the runes know the proper rituals to inscribe them, and can activate the runes on items through magic, even if they weren't the ones to inscribe them. Runes are inherently dangerous. I can't hammer that point home hard enough. You have to know the purpose of the rune to use it, and if you try and fail, very bad things will happen to you, and probably to a lot of people standing around you. This is not a pass or fail scenario. It's more like a pass or explode scenario. The Godi and Wise Women believe the runes are a gift from Odin to help protect their clans and family from those that would destroy it. They are considered divine magic by the Northmen, but they're also much more than just clerical magic. Those most familiar with the runes and their history believe them to be the language of the Old Ones, the building blocks of reality. Immortals use this language to create new worlds and species. It's not magic meant for mortals. So why did Odin give this magic to his followers? To preserve it. Immortals have a lot of enemies, and not just other immortals. Gods want the souls and worship of the mortals denied to them. Archfiends, of course, are all about the soul trade and get rather upset when their plans are thwarted by the Council of Etrusion or the Knights of Ebony. Then you have the aberrations that would love to dominate, control, or utterly destroy the mortals that are denied to them. Immortals are tasked with protecting their followers. After all, no more followers, no more immortals. Odin knows the horrors that lay outside the Great Barrier all too well, once being an avatar of a god himself before being cut off and ascending to immortality as a mortal. He has fought countless battles against the devils, demons, and angels who would destroy his home plan. He understands why Oberon holds nothing but hate for the elven tyrant god Corellian Lorathian. The Allfather wants his followers prepared in case he could not save them, so he gave them runic magic. The gifting of runes to mortals was dangerous, and it was not without controversy even among the immortals. Other religions see the runes as an abomination, as it kills fully half of those who try to earn one. Churches in other lands see the followers of Odin as a bunch of suicidal fanatics willing to hang themselves at the command of their patron immortal. Because of this, branding ceremonies are done in secret, and those that have the runes don't go out of their way to flaunt them. But the followers of the Ace there know the reason behind the runes, and see the sacrifice as the price of Odin's gift. Earning a rune is not something done lightly, as you can expect. It's not just a matter of walking up to a wise woman, getting branded, and hope the infection doesn't kill you. It is a complicated ritual that depends on the recipient of the rune as well as the one inscribing it. The person seeking the rune has to research which one he wants, and this being Viking lands, it's not like you can go and look it up in a library. Instead, the petitioner will be traveling from temple to temple talking to various clerics about what they know about the runes, seeking information from wise women who know of the individual rune and its true meaning. Only then will they find someone willing to perform the ceremony. The actual ceremony can happen in a lot of different fashions, depending on the petitioner and their patron immortal. Odin was the one that taught the runes, but now every patron of the Northern Realms embraces the runic ceremonies. A follower of Thor might have a rousing party before setting out to the mountain home of the wise woman willing to perform the ritual. Compare that to a follower of Forseti, who prefers a simple vigil of prayer and meditation. The ritual is always a private affair, just between the petitioner, the bestower of the runes, and a few friends or assistants to help with the ceremony. 
The exact ritual varies by the patron immortal of the Seeker of the Rune. A Godar prays over the recipient, while a wise woman might chastise him to prove that he is truly ready for what is about to happen. Then the petitioner is given a poison to start the ritual, the rune is branded into his skin, and then he is placed in a situation that causes mortal danger to see if the immortals deem him worthy. This is where the runes earn their reputation for both good and bad. Every immortal has their petitioner tried in different ways. Odin's followers hang themselves from trees. Frey and Freya's followers are left on a funeral pyre that is fortunately left unlit. Hell's petitioners are exposed to the elements. Followers of Loki are entombed alive. Here they are left for nine nights. Only then does the master of the ceremony return. If the petitioner was not successful, then they are truly dead. Nothing can return them to life, not even a wish spell. The burial ceremony is then completed, with the pyre being lit, the tomb being resealed, or the body being left to rot on the tree. This is done to remind those that seek the runes how deadly the process is. Nothing makes you rethink trying to get the ability to summon your horse with a thought than by seeing all the hanging corpses of the guys that failed to do the same thing earlier. If you are one of the lucky ones that survived the ritual, congratulations, you have a rune. However, your faith will be tested in the state of half-death you're in for nine nights. Being pious isn't enough. If it was, everybody would have a rune. You have to fully understand the nature of the rune, its purpose, and its use. Survivals of the ritual remember being tested mentally by their patron about their understanding of the rune that they were asking for. It is assumed that those that can't answer the questions don't come back. It's not like you can ask them. But the stress on the body is quite severe, and that's also a factor in all the fatalities. Those that understand the runes but don't answer the questions to the satisfaction of their patron will get a rune when they awaken, but it will be the rune the immortal deems the petitioner needs, not the one he wants. Ones that are able to satisfy their immortal will find themselves the owner of the requested rune. Getting the rune that you asked for is obviously worth far more prestige among your peers than just coming back with any old rune. So be sure to max out either your religion skill or your reverence trait. If you're one of the few people that actually used that rule. Speaking of things in the Northern Reaches Gazetteer that were never mentioned or brought up again. Even if you survived the ritual, having the literal alphabet of your deity branded on your body and then getting poisoned, hung and left for dead is going to take a toll on it. Upon waking, the new rune holder will find his constitution permanently reduced. Like dying in the ritual, this can't be reversed by any means. You wanted to have a powerful magical rune not meant for this world burned into your flesh? You're going to pay the cost. No suffering, no rune. Likewise, using magic to try to survive the ritual causes the ritual to automatically fail. No potions, no magic items, no helpful spells. If you try and cheat, you wake up without a rune, and the Godar or wise woman will automatically know what you did and good luck asking them to perform the ritual again. Runic magic is unheard of in other lands. Very few people would willingly undergo a ritual with such a high rate of failure. You can't unwillingly attempt to gain runes, and since the Northern Immortals judge who is worthy, lands where they aren't worshipped obviously don't have runes. But it's not just the Immortals. You have to approach someone who understands the runes and knows how to apply them. Odin gave this knowledge directly to certain followers, and they safeguard that knowledge. You can't pray for a rune. The immortals decide if you're worthy to have one, but they don't take part in getting one until after you've poisoned yourself and you're hanging on that tree. Not all Godi even know the runes. It requires a spell specific to their pantheon. The no rune spell will fill a Godi's head with knowledge about the rune that they're asking about. This will allow them to inscribe it or activate it. But each time they cast the no rune spell, it costs them a permanent point of constitution. There is no way of learning all the runes as a mortal. You'll run out of constitution long before you run out of runes. The wise women have a basic understanding of the runes, but they share their knowledge as a group. They don't know as much about a specific rune as a Godar who has used the no rune spell, but as a collective group, they can provide as much insight. While you might need to get help from several of them to learn a specific rune, they aren't burning through their constitution scores as fast either. Not all runes are carved into the bodies of the followers of the ace there. With the right knowledge, runes can be inscribed on objects such as armor or even standing stones. Activating the runes when used in this way require clerical magic, and the Godar or wise woman has to know not just the rune being activated, but the effect being triggered. A Godar will know all aspects of a rune thanks to the no rune spell, where a wise woman might just know a few single uses from various runes. Some runes are more likely to be found on an object than a person, often inscribed to honor an event. Any Godor or wise woman who knows the Bless Rune spell can cast it on the item to activate one of the abilities. The runes are also used as a divining tool, with the cleric or wise woman throwing down a set of non-magical tiles carved with each of the runes, then casting a spell that shows a message from the immortals. It acts like an augury spell, but is much more informative. 
The cleric can ask a single question, and one that is often quite specific. Once the spell is cast, the runes will provide an answer to the cleric. If the question is a good one, the immortals are inclined to answer truthfully, and even provide a bit of advice on how to proceed. If the question is a waste of time, then it won't be answered, and the caster will receive a chewing out on how wasting the immortals' time is a very bad thing, and they should be very careful the next time they ask a dumb question. That's going to wrap up runic magic. It's an obscure source of magic, restricted to a certain region, a certain pantheon, and even just a few clerics in that pantheon. They're deadly, random, and aren't even healthy to have one. But for players that are willing to risk permadeath for their character, it is definitely something that they will brag about. Just remember, to work, the rune has to be visible, so be careful where you get branded. Next week, it's time for another villain spotlight. We're heading to the Savage Coast to look at one of the most powerful dragons of all time, Pyre Vermilion. Remember, though, if you're going to pass the runes, it'll take a lot of skills.